So. So. We get to address the elephant in the room. No, I prefer we don't. Why is Abraham Lincoln sitting in the middle of the studio? I don't know. He's been sitting in here since I walked in this morning. He screamed like a little girl and then he spilled coffee on me. I did not scream like a little girl. I screamed like a middle-aged woman. There's a difference. He's just been sitting here? Has he said anything? Did you ask why he's here? No, after I spilled coffee on him, we got into a screaming match and he tried to wrestle me. I would have won. Oh, shut up, Beardy. Okay, I've had enough of this. Mr. President, could you please explain uh, how and why you're here? Certainly. Half a score and two years ago, 20th Century Fox brought forth to this world a new film conceived in a writing room and dedicated to the proposition of making fat stacks of cash. Can you get to the point, please? All right, I'm gonna keep it real. There's a movie about me where I hunt vampires. Make a video about it, it would be funny. Hang on, that's why you're here? You rose from the dead and then came all the way here and loitered in my studio just to ask me to make fun of a movie. Yeah, that's about it. I'm not even sure how I'm supposed to respond to this. Well, I guess you gotta make a video. What? Why? He is technically the president. He's been dead for like a hundred years. That doesn't make him not the president. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it does. So, you gonna do it? I guess it would be kind of funny. All right, I'll review the movie. Sick, I'm gonna get this on my Facebook. But you're gonna be surveilled. I'm not letting a dead president roam free in my studio. Paper bag! Yeah! Keep an eye on Lincoln. If he tries anything funny, you know what to do. Cool, it's been a while since I got to bite someone's face off. He's not gonna do that, right? Don't worry, he's just joking. I hope. Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter is a 2012 action horror movie directed by... That guy, who also produced the movie alongside Jim Made Like One Thing Lemley and Tim Certified Spooky Man Burton. Don't get excited, he just financed the movie and as far as I can tell had no direct involvement with the film itself. Which is a little bit disappointing because I was totally ready to watch this movie and see Johnny Depp in 10 layers of goth makeup playing Lincoln. The movie was actually based off a book of the same name, written by a guy named Seth Graham Smith, who also wrote the screenplay for this movie. His other works include Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, as well as The Spider-Man Handbook. Got both ends of the fictional spectrum there. The film was meant to release in October 2011, but instead was pushed back to June of 2012, when it had an unconventional debut being screened for US troops deployed in the Middle East. Yeah, when this movie released, it was screened for 2,000 sailors aboard the USS Abraham Lincoln in an exclusive event that was attended by many of the film's stars, including Benjamin Walker, who appeared in character as Lincoln. Imagine being deployed to the Middle East, seeing man-made horrors beyond your comprehension, barely surviving, watching your friends die, questioning if it was all worth it, and then Abraham Lincoln walks up and makes you watch his movie. I would go full on Private Pile. Upon release, the film received mixed to average reviews from most critics, many criticizing the film's cheap effects and overly serious tone. It made money somehow, earning $116 million at the box office. I can't get any information as to the actual budget of the movie. Wikipedia puts it anywhere between $69 million and $99 million. So the movie either made a decent amount of cash or barely scraped by. I'm guessing the latter since we don't have a presidential cinematic universe yet. And that's about it. The film released, made an undetermined amount of money, and then faded into obscurity, only for idiots like me to drag it out of the grave and laugh at it on the internet. But did this movie deserve better? Uh -huh. I really don't think there's that much to this. It's the definition of a modern day B movie. This is the Santa Claus Conquers the Martians of our generation. Without further ado, let's take a look at Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. Roll film. <laughs> The movie opens with a Bible quote. Uh, it's Bible. It's quote the Bible right there because it's Abraham. <laughs> After that, the movie cuts to the wrong president's monument as dialogue from the lost version of Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln plays in the background. The year is 1865 and Lincoln is writing in his diary. This is the framing device for the movie's whole story, Lincoln's personal retelling of his life through the journal that he carries throughout most of the film. Old Abe here is going to tell us the story of what really happened on the Titanic, I mean his life. We then fade to Lincoln as a boy in Pigeon Creek, Indiana. 
This movie takes place back in the good old days before child labor got banned as young Abe is working alongside his parents for this evil Willy Wonka looking guy named Jack Bartz. Abe's friend Will over here is getting beat by a slaver. Abe responds as anyone else would in this situation by running at the slaver with an axe. Abe, being a literal child and thus weak as paper, loses, giving us this epic 3D whip shot before Abe's father punches Slavey McSlavery face into the river. This displeases Bartz. Until every man is free, we are all slaves. <laughs> Very well then, since y'all so concerned with freedom, you may consider yourself free from the burden of my employ. <laughs> In addition to firing him, Bartz wants Abe's dad to pay off his debts to him in full. Abe's dad refuses because Bartz hits kids, and my legal team says I'm required by law to say that hitting kids is, quote, mad cringe, yo. Bartz ain't gonna take that, though, ominously saying that there's more than one way to pay off a debt. Wonder what's gonna happen now. We then cut to the Lincoln family home, where little Abe is staying up writing in his diary like the wimpy kid he is when he sees something enter the house. This is when the movie remembers that it's technically a horror movie and tries to be scary. Don't get used to this, this is like the only time the movie actually does this. Though I am ashamed to say, this part made me jump a little. Okay, and... Oh, okay, that's... Feel free to laugh at me in the comments. Anyway, Abe's mother has fallen ill with some unknown condition and dies just a few minutes later. Abe saw what happened, though, and knows that Bart's and his silly-looking hat is responsible for this, marking the start of a vendetta. During his mother's funeral, Abe's dad tells him not to do anything foolish. We then cut to nine years later where Abe's dad is dead and he no longer has to listen to him. Our now adult Abe is getting drunk at a bar in preparation to go kill Bart's. This is where he meets mysterious mystery dude, who asks Abe why he's getting drunk at 3 a.m. instead of in the middle of the day like a normal person. A boy only gets this drunk when he wants to kiss a girl or kill a man. What if I want to kill both? Abe runs off to go commit that homicide he's been planning for the past nine years, and we cut to Bart's meeting with Evilly Evil Dude. He's important later, he has an actual name, just be patient. The bad guys row, row, row their boat evilly down the stream, giving Abe the perfect opportunity to sneak up on Bart's and perform a stealth kill. Abe rolls a nat 1 during his attack, though, and his pistol fails on him mid-murder. Abe flees to a conveniently placed shack to reload his pistol with Bart's in hot pursuit. Abe barely manages a reload in time, giving us an epic 3D gunshot and killing Bart's. With his mother's death event, Abe proudly walks off, leaving the body behind for literally just anyone to find, and ending the movie. Hey, wait a second, where'd the body go? Oh, that's where it went. So Bart seems to have missed the memo about getting shot in the face and how that would normally result in death. He then picks up Abe and slams him into the dock face first. All looks to be lost for our pal Abe. Luckily, Mysterious Mystery Guy shows up out of literally nowhere to help out. Now we cut to later, where Abe is recovering from getting the absolute snot beaten out of him in that fight. Here we get properly introduced to Mysterious Mystery Dude, better known as Henry Sturgis. He criticizes Abe for his ill plan and overall sloppy attempt at committing a murder, which, honestly, yeah. Henry tells Abe that Bart's is actually a vampire, and not only are vampires real, but they apparently operate all over the United States as a sort of infestation. Like rats! Or hipsters. Abe's in the middle of his vengeance grind set and begs Henry to teach him how to hunt vampires. Henry's a bit reluctant though due to the previously mentioned sloppy, drunken, failed homicide. Luckily though, Abe is a master of negotiation. Please. No. Please. No. Please. No. Please. No. Pretty please. Okay, fine. Yes! Henry lays out some ground rules, though. If Abe's gonna do this, he's gotta abandon all notions of revenge and give up human interaction forever. No friends, no family. Abe ain't listening to any of this, though, and scrolls to the end of the user license agreement to find the accept button. Now that Abe's an official vampire hunter, he's gotta get armed. He's first presented with the most American option available, but as we've seen, Abe's not exactly specced for the gunslinger class, so instead he's going with a melee build. Time for Abe to go through his epic training arc. <laughs> The first challenge of Abe's training arc is to chop down this tree in a single swing. But this isn't just a tree, it's what Abe hates the most. Or at least that's what Henry says. Looks like a tree to me, but what do I know? Henry keeps yelling at Abe until he manages to take down the tree. Abe's learned something, I guess. Comes not from hate, but from truth. 
I have no idea what the point of that sequence was. Next, Abe's gotta learn how to fight without seeing, as vampires can turn themselves invisible. The movie ran out of budget for fight scenes here, so we just get noises over a black screen. Now we finally get a proper training montage, as over the course of a few weeks, Abe learns how to spin an axe, how to spin an axe while fighting, and how to catch an axe and then spin it. Stuff like that. Abe also learns that the vampire's key weakness is silver, as it is a curse upon the cursed. I don't entirely know what that means, but hey, at least Abe got a cool new skin for his axe. Finally, we get a list of future boss fights Abe is gonna have to face. There's Bartz alongside random vampire lady who isn't important enough for me to remember her actual name, and evilly evil dude, real name Adam, who all other vampires are descended from. Oh, I get it, cause, cause like the Bible? According to Henry, vampires have existed in America for centuries. When European settlers arrived with slaves, the vampires saw an excellent business opportunity and now primarily operate in the south. Recently though, they've been pushing more into the north, and it's up to vampire hunters like Abe and Henry to keep them under control. They are literally supernatural pest control. Hi, I'm Don Joe, and are vampires a pain in your neck? If so, you need to call Vamp Busters. Ignore any and all similarity to a certain other paranormal extermination company and check out the reliable services that Vamp Busters offer. We've got years of experience keeping homes and businesses just like yours free from undead menaces. Our highly trained technicians use only the bleeding edge of vampire hunting technology, so unlike the vampires infesting your property, you can rest in peace. Our round-the-clock surveillance will keep you safe from supernatural harm both day and night. And unlike other services, we don't suck you dry with extra fees and bills, we charge up front! So call Vamp Busters today, because we're gonna get sued for copyright infringement any day now. Vamp Busters, what individual will you be contacting? Is, is that seriously what we're going with? It is? Okay. A few years later, with his training complete, Abe travels to Springfield, Illinois to begin his vampire hunting career. While looking for a place to stay, Abe meets Joshua Speed, who is supposed to be helping Sean and Gus track down the Yin Yang Killer, but instead is running the shop. He offers Abe a room in exchange for working at his store. He also becomes Abe's friend slash sidekick thing, but that's not really that important. While here, Abe meets Mary Todd, who is supposed to be a general in the New Republic, but instead is here, alongside Stephen Douglas, played by Alan Tudyk. Yeah, I've got no joke for him, he's in too many things for me to decide on the reference. It would kind of be a waste of time anyway because this character is in only like two scenes and then he's kind of irrelevant. Abe receives a letter from Henry telling him the location of a vampire and later that night he heads off on his first official hunt. This doesn't go too well as Abe gets a face full of pocket sand from this pharmacist vampire and then gets dropped into a trap. Abe's a bit SOL or stuck oriented lousily as they say. Luckily Abe packed a backup knife allowing him to escape the trap and then delivers the Patrick Bateman special to Mr. Pharmacist. Abe buries the body and the next day attends a party with speed where Abe demonstrates his presidential riz. I can't believe I actually wrote this. What is wrong with me? After the party scene, we get another vampire hunt. The actual vampire hunting is probably one of the best parts of the movie. The action is great, the fights are choreographed well, and because the scenes are so small and condensed, you don't really notice the less than amazing CGI. Plus, Abe's got some pretty sick kills. Like here, where he decapitates a guy with a shelf. Or here, where he burns the face off a guy with a blacksmith forge. Unfortunately, we can't spend the whole movie killing vampires in increasingly horrific ways, as we cut to Abe and Mary having a picnic. That may be the most abrupt shift in tone I have ever seen. Sure hope that's not indicative of issues with a movie as a whole. And the business. We call this foreshadowing. Later, Abe is walking Mary home, and because Abe is canonically a six foot four giant, he stands on top of his hat in order to kiss him. This is supposed to be a cute scene between the two of them, but I'm more focused on the hat. Either this hat is indestructible, or Mary has hollow bones and weighs next to nothing. The two of them must have been distracted as well, because neither of them noticed Bart's watching them from across the street like the creep he is. Now we cut to Disneyland's Haunted Mansion, where Adam and random vampire lady see the news of Abe's recent vampire murder spree and plan to put a stop to him. That scene's over, back to Abe. He's in the shop trying to to become a different kind of blood-sucking monster by studying law, when suddenly the Falcon walks in. This is actually Will Johnson, Abe's friend from the opening of the movie who was getting beat by that slaver. Abe describes him as his best friend, actually, and this makes Speed a little jealous. Wonder if that's gonna be relevant later. Will's not really that important of a character, if I'm being completely honest. He's only really here to inspire Abe to get into politics after they beat up some bounty hunters. Henry's back in the movie suddenly. He and Abe have a bit of a pointless fight where Abe yells at Henry for not letting him go kill Bartz. Before Henry awkwardly gifts him a watch, and then tells him to go get back on that revenge grind set. Looks like it's time for a boss fight. A brawl is surely brutal. You're up. <laughs> Abe completely misses his first shot, and Bartz flees into a stampede of horses. It may not look like it, considering how bad the CGI gets, but this is actually an awesome scene. There's horses getting slammed into the ground, people flying through the air. Bartz even grabs a horse by the leg and flings it at Abe, who then jumps on top of said horse and rides after him, axe in hand. This is amazing. So long, Abe Bowser. 
Abe catches up to Bart and narrowly avoids getting a piece of his neck chomped out when the two of them tumble down the side of a cliff. They tussle a bit before Abe finishes the fight by shooting Bart in the face with his axe gun. Did I mention he has an axe gun? He has an axe gun. Abraham Lincoln has an axe gun. This is the greatest movie ever made. Humanity has peaked. Nothing will ever be better than this. Before Abe finishes him off, Bart implies that Henry is hiding something. We then cut, you get it, because axe, to some random alley, where Abe discovers Henry feasting on this random guy's delicious nectar. You get it, because neck? Turns out, Henry's been a vampire this entire time. Abe is understandably a little upset that his friend has been the very thing he swore to destroy and tries to kill him. Henry manages to calm him down, and we get a flashback to Henry's past before he was a vampire. He apparently had a wife. Keyword had. Adam tracked him down at some point and turned him into a vampire before then killing his wife right in front of him. This is supposed to be a very serious, dramatic character moment, but I cannot take it seriously. Partly because of Adam spinning the wife around like a rag doll while killing her, but mostly because of the stupid faces Henry makes while turning. After managing to uncross his eyes, Henry jumps up and attempts to stab Adam. This is when we learn that apparently vampires cannot kill other vampires, because... It's one of God's little tricks. Vampires cannot kill their own kind. Only the living can kill the dead. Yeah, Professor Reagan, can I get a source on that? Yeah, you're on your own with that, I got nothing. So anyway, we cut back to the present. Despite hearing his tragic backstory, Abe is mad at Henry for never telling him he's a vampire, and he begins to lose faith in the vampire hunting mission. Abe walks back to the store to go mope some more, and almost axes Mary in the face when she sneaks up behind him. Mary's been getting kind of suspicious of Abe and keeps asking what he's been doing. Abe can't have the whole vampire hunting thing get revealed, so he does something a little bit extreme. No, not really. He actually proposes marriage to her, and we cut to their wedding, with all of Abe's friends in attendance. Speed's still looking a little bit jealous of Will. Sure hope this doesn't have lasting consequences. Meanwhile, Adam and the rest of the Super Spooky Squad are attending a funeral for Bart's. Adam's ticked off at all the vampire murder and tells his minions to send Abe an invite to their plantation. To ensure that Abe RSVPs, the Super Spooky team abduct Will, and he finally has a purpose other than to make Speed jealous. Speaking of Speed, he informs Abe about the kidnapping of Will, and the two of them head off on a rescue mission. Abe reveals the whole vampire hunting thing to speed, and he's surprisingly chill about it. We then get this honestly really sick shot as the dynamic duo enter New Orleans. The paranormal punching pals make their way to the vampire plantation, making note of the suspicious lack of slaves roaming the grounds. So Abe and Speed sneak onto the set of the latest Jordan Peele film, as it turns out the slaves have all been taken inside to be feasted on by the vampires. Abe kicks down the back door and rushes in, only to be ambushed by a horde of vampires, who use their power of turning everything blue to confuse and disorient him. Seriously, what is with this filter? Did the editor spill power rate on the film or something? It's really distracting. What's also distracting is this scene's over-reliance on slow motion effects. There is way too much slow-mo. It takes a lot of energy out of what are otherwise some really cool kills. <laughs> After slaughtering an entire room full of vampires, Abe manages to get himself pinned under a chair by Adam and random vampire lady. With Abe incapacitated, Adam delivers his evil villain monologue, and I'm not gonna lie, some of these lines go pretty hard. Men have enslaved each other since they invented gods to forgive them for doing it. Here's where we actually learn what the villain's end goal is. You see, Adam basically wants to create an undead ethno-state by turning America into a nation of vampires so that his people can have their quote-unquote rightful place. His exact motivation for doing this is kinda unclear. He's either a vampire supremacist, or he's trying to achieve vampire social justice. I'm assuming the former because of the whole slave-owning thing. To achieve his ultimate uncertain goal, he wants Abe to give in to the dark side and join his cause. If he doesn't do it, then he's gonna kill Will. Hey, that rhymed. Abe refuses, of course, and just before Adam can do the Will killing, Speed comes in clutch by ramming a carriage through the front door and drifting it into random vampire lady. Whoever wrote this into the movie deserves a medal. <laughs>
The terrific trio barely managed to escape the plantation and are helped out by Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad. I'm not kidding, they're important later, so remember they're in the movie. Now the team are all back together safe and sound, it's time for Abe to fully begin his political career. He's already killed like two dozen people, so he's pretty qualified, all things considered. He's running for president to try and put an end to slavery. Henry thinks this is a bad idea, but not for the reason you're probably thinking. Don't deny it, you were thinking it. The slave trade has been the only thing keeping the vampires under control for all these years because the slaves are used as their primary food supply. Jesus Christ, on a bike that's messed up. Henry and Abe go their separate ways, and Abe gives up on vampire hunting, instead choosing to focus on becoming president, and giving us this epic reveal of Abe's presidential drip. Yeah, I mean, does he have the beard? I'm, I'm waiting on it. He's got the beard, everybody! He's got the beard! We have beard! So, you remember how this is an action movie? Remember all the fun, nonsensical violence, the cool fight scenes, all that stuff? Well, I hope you enjoyed that, because for the next 20 minutes of the movie, we're getting none of it! That's why, from here on out, this is a History Channel documentary. The movie completely forgets what it's actually supposed to be and starts to become a biography, which normally I would enjoy, but I'm not watching Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter to learn things. I'm watching Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter because I want to see Abraham Lincoln emancipate someone's limbs from their body with an axe. At least it has some relatively good cinematography, and we do get to see some pretty neat battle sequences. For like a second before it cuts to 50-year-old Abe in his office with his kid. So anyway, as for what's left of the movie's plot, the Civil War is in full swing. Abe is president and has signed the Emancipation Proclamation. The vampires haven't completely left the movie yet, as random vampire lady has managed to infiltrate the White House. She then bites Abe's son, afflicting him with the same condition that killed Abe's mother. Everything involving the death of Abe's son is probably the worst part of the movie. Not on a technical level, because everything is still very well shot and even acted. It even makes sense on a narrative level, because it brings Abe to arguably his lowest point and establishes that the vampires are still a Freddy has to deal with. No, it's the worst part of the movie because it doesn't belong in this movie. I think the best way to explain what I mean is to describe what's happening in the scene. Abe and his wife are forced to watch their young son die slowly to an incurable condition that previously took the life of Abe's mother. When his son finally does die after a lengthy period of suffering, Abe is inconsolable. He sits despondent on the White House balcony, blaming himself. Mary begs of visiting Henry to resurrect her son, even if it means bringing him back as a vampire, as something not human. Human. Having read Abe's journal and discovered the truth about him, she screams at Abe that he brought this on them, that he brought this on their son. Abe can't help but silently agree. You know, less than 15 minutes ago, someone was Tokyo drifting a horse-drawn carriage into a vampire. This isn't tonal whiplash, this is tonal decapitation. You can't have a story as conceptually silly as Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, and then stick something as heavy as the death of a child and its effects on a family into it almost three quarters of the way through. And like I said, I get this in terms of the narrative. It's to give Abe a low point for him to rise up from for the climax. But they did it in about the worst way possible considering how the movie has been thus far. I digress, though. After a reminder of the horror and brutality of warfare, we cut to Jefferson Davis conducting an interview with a vampire. The vampires have been recruited to fight in the Confederate Army, being deployed at Gettysburg to great effect in an actually really cool and well-shot scene. The vampires are immune to all conventional weaponry, meaning the South now has an invincible undead army at their disposal. This is pretty bad for Abe and the boys, because if the Union Army takes another L, the Confederates will be in Washington and the war essentially lost. There's still hope, though, because Abe's silverware gives them an idea. He remembers that the vampires are weak to silver and orders the confiscation of silver items from across the country country to be melted down and made into weapons, which are then to be shipped to Gettysburg via Railroad. Remember that word Railroad, it'll be important. It's time for all of Speed's looks of jealous anger to finally become relevant. He blames Abe for tearing the country apart and betrays him by telling the vampires about the train transporting the weapons. Henry spots him mid-betrayal though. Meanwhile, Abe retrieves his axe and he, Will, and Speed go to accompany the train on its way to Gettysburg. Also meanwhile, Mary is fleeing Washington with the Underground Railroad. Team Abe are on board the train, just kind of sitting around. Henry shows up the tattle on speed, but Abe says Henry doesn't know what he's talking about. He says this right as the vampires attack the train, all but confirming the betrayal. Will's in the back fighting off vampires with a double-barreled shotgun and maybe the only other scene where he actually does anything, and then runs in to get Abe in the fight. Abe opens the next scene by throwing the bayonet end of his axe gun at a vampire like a spear, judo flips another vampire out of the train, and then kicks the severed head of another vampire like a bloody soccer ball. This is everything I've ever wanted out of a movie. TV! It knows what I want! Alright, now it's time for maybe the coolest fight sequence in the entire movie. There's everything here. Blood, decapitation, impaling, Abe spinning the axe around like a madman chopping into vampires left and right. It is epic. And keep in mind, in this scene, Abe is 50 years old. Man is 
built different. The slaughter is stopped by the sudden appearance of Adam, who kicks away Abe and breaks his axe in the movie's most tragic scene. With Abe now unarmed and knocked down, it's time for the final boss fight. Will runs at Adam and gets slammed. Abe barely manages to grab a hold of his friend before he falls off, leaving him vulnerable. Adam takes this moment to deliver one final meaningless evil monologue and attempts to bite Abe, but Henry shows up out of literally nowhere to take the hit for him. We then incredibly abruptly cut to random vampire lady setting fire to a bridge that the train is about to cross, before then abruptly cutting to Henry getting slammed for the roof of a train car and then into a box of silver weapons. But actually, no, not really, because as it turns out, none of the silver is aboard the train. Abe has successfully pulled off the greatest troll operation in American history, just as the Founding Fathers intended. It's not over yet, though, because the train is heading straight for that flaming bridge from earlier. Speed is trying to meet up with Abe, but gets intercepted by Adam, where it's revealed that Speed's betrayal from earlier was part of Abe's plan to get all the vampires into one place. I know this seems like the kind of stupid twist that I would make fun of, but I'm honestly tempted to applaud the movie for this, because I was totally convinced that Speed was going to betray Team Abe. I did not see any of this coming. Adam kills Speed, and Abe has a Darth Vader no moment, just as the train hits the burning bridge. Now it's time for the movie's epic climax, where Abe and his remaining friends climb across falling train cars on a flaming bridge. How did this movie not succeed? Adam has Abe and Will cornered, but in one final sick kill, Abe wraps his pocket watch around his fist and punches Adam through the stomach. You know, if I had a nickel for every time I watched a villain named Adam die at the last minute due to being stabbed in the stomach of something their species is specifically weak to, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? Anyway, Abe and Will have climbed back aboard what's left of the train as it attempts to make it up the last bit of track. It looks like they're not gonna make it, but once again, Henry shows up out of nowhere and holds the collapsing track pieces so that Abe and Will can jump to safety as the train falls into the abyss. So the team, minus Speed, who has basically just forgotten after this point, despite being the only reason this plan could work in the first place, hashtag justice for Speed, is all together, victorious over the forces of darkness. Abe calls Henry a credit to his... race, I guess? Are vampires a race? Henry then asks the question on everyone's mind. Okay, well I guess one of the questions on everyone's mind, where the heck are all those silver weapons we raided half the country to make? Well, they said they were transporting the silver via railroad. They didn't say which one. Turns out Mary and the Underground Railroad were actually secretly transporting the silver. See, I told you they'd be important later. Also, while she's here, Mary shoots and kills random vampire lady for killing her son. the Union Army is properly equipped, we get a pretty epic vampire slaughter montage, followed by Abe delivering the Gettysburg Address. I'm just gonna take this moment to say how good of a job Benjamin Walker has been doing playing Lincoln. The acting in this movie is pretty good all across the board, with no real standout good or bad performances, but I think Walker plays Abe really well, especially in these more historical scenes. I hope he got paid well for this movie, because unlike other actors in this film, he doesn't seem to have gone on to do anything major. Anyway, it's time to wrap things up. The Battle of Gettysburg has been won, and the war is over. With that, the vampires have fled America to wreak havoc on the rest of the world. Yet again proving the superiority of the USA as the only vampire-free nation in the world. Take that, Europe! Abe is finishing up his journal, and Henry is trying to convince Abe to become a vampire so that they can be immortal vampire buddies. Abe refuses, though, and leaves the White House for an important meeting. With Abe off to see a mind-blowing theatrical performance... Oh. oh, come on! I had to give it a shot! Oh. You know, I just think you guys aren't in the right headspace. Like Lincoln! Oh. We fade to the modern day, where Henry is meeting a man with homicidal intentions in a bar, much like he did with Abe, ending the movie and perpetuating the cycle of violence. Fun fact, the guy Henry meets in the bar is played by Seth Graham Smith, meaning I have to imagine that Henry is meeting with him to sell the book rights to Abe's story. Line, pretty good. Let's see if it's anything after the credits. Well, that's the film, folks, and uh. Still a better vampire movie than Morbius. To be completely honest, this movie is very much so a mixed bag. On one hand, it's a goofy action movie with subpar effects, a less than stellar plot, and nothing much of real value. On the other hand, Abraham Lincoln is killing vampires with an axe gun. The best parts of this movie are very much so the action and fight scenes. Yeah, they don't look great even for 2012, and yeah, they're a little silly, but I can ignore that because they're awesome. Really, the biggest problem that this movie has is its tone. The movie plays itself way too seriously, and I'm not saying it has to be over-the-top complete nonsense, I'm just saying it should be a little more consistent. It goes from Abe fighting vampires on a plantation to Abe mourning the loss of his young son way too quickly. 
The movie is essentially two halves, the first where it's a fun action movie, and the second where it's a History Channel special that ends with a fiery train battle. Really, if you cut out the middle chunk where it becomes a biography, or at least shortened it and got back to the action, the movie would have been a lot better. It's kind of disappointing that nothing else has been done with this movie's ideas, because the potential is there. I joked a lot, but I really think that this could have been a really cool video game, actually. A sort of gory Arkham-style beat-em-up where you fight vampires across Civil War-era America as an axe ruling Abraham Lincoln would have been epic. All in all, it's a dumb, fun action movie with a lot of potential that never really goes anywhere. Have I seen worse movies? Yes. But have I seen better movies? Also yes. I give this movie a final rating of 6 axes out of 10. Now if you excuse me, I need to go kick a dead president out of my studio. Okay, I reviewed the movie. Can you please... Hello! Paperbag, where's Lincoln? Who? The guy I told you to watch? Oh yeah! That guy! Yeah. Um... Where is he? He's in the what? The what? Ah! How did I not notice that? Hey guys, what's going on? He's in the loft. Yeah, I know. The time has come for me to depart from this world, for my work here is done. But you didn't do anything. Just, just let him have this. I leave the American people with this message. Change the world. Goodbye. Also invade Canada, it'd be funny. Bye! There goes the best vampire hunting president this country ever had. Yeah. This is really weird. This, this is kind of weird. Yeah, it was. Wasn't it? Really, really kind of was. Yeah. yeah.